you know, every once in a while you got to kind of bring the first iron out and be like, hey, you know, <laughs> like you got to get it together because no one else, you're going to be the best savior for yourself. What's up, Chris? What's going on? How you doing? <laughs> All right, man. Thanks for being here. I appreciate um, it. We'll just start off, why don't you tell us your name, uh, branch of service you served with, uh, the years you served, and the rank you got out as. Okay. Uh, my name is Chris O'Malley. I served with the uh, United States Army uh, from 1994 to 2015, and I retired as a first sergeant. Right on. Um, what, uh, what job did you sign up as? Uh, I was a Seaburn guy. Okay. So chemical. Oh, what, what does that entail? So it's chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear. Um, so we do the decontamination if necessary, the reconnaissance uh, of those, and uh, try to clear paths uh, when it's used, mm. uh, as well as a lot of different hazmat uh, environments there. Right on, right on. Um, uh, talk to me a little bit about uh, where you were born and raised and uh, what your upbringing was like. Okay, so uh, I was born in uh, the south side of Chicago uh, to a single mother. Uh, so with my, my mother and then my, raised by my grandparents. I uh, went to Catholic school for uh, 13 years, uh, so that was fun. Mm -hmm. um, uh, all boys high school uh, and then uh, yeah just kind of grew up uh, on the south side uh, did you know your normal stuff sports and um, but uh, spent a lot of time trying to stay out of trouble so um, what inspired you to go into the army uh, really just kind of a, a better life um, trying to I kind of got in a little bit of trouble my senior year um, so kind of lost opportunities for some scholarships or whatever but um, so uh, kind of just to uh, really get the GI Bill um, and kind of move in that direction, um, really see the world and stuff like that. But uh, then I ended up getting uh, stationed at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, which was about uh, six hours away from where I grew up. So I wasn't oh, wow. really seeing the world now, which turned out to be great because four day weekends and stuff like that, I could go back up uh, and, and uh, you know, see my family, my friends and stuff like that. So it ended up, ended up working out. Now did, uh, um, did you choose what made you choose the Army uh, over the other branches? Um, it was really down to the Army and the Marines for me. It's just kind of uh, kind of something I wanted to do. I kind of wanted to be more hands-on uh, in that aspect. And uh, to be frankly, uh, the Marine recruiter just annoyed me. It really got on my nerves. I, yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, not to say that would have been a bad uh, choice at all, uh, but, you know, just being young and uh, just kind of, I went more on a personality. I was down to the two. Uh, the army recruiter seemed all right, uh, although yeah, he didn't really tell me the truth either, though. So <laughs> you know, they never do. That's how they, you know, like used car salesmen. Man. You know what? Yeah. I think every single vet that's sat in this seat has the same exact story about that. You know, oh yeah, showing yeah. you they probably showed you some cool video. Oh yeah, yeah, some awesome, some pictures of I, I don't know what dorms, what college dorms they were, but these are going to be your barracks. And like, no, nah, I came into World War II barracks at Fort Campbell, and <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, and then, yeah, you just what your, your daily life is. And, um, you know, my grandfather was, um, so there was some, some patriotic stuff. I mean, my grandfather was in World War II. Uh, he was in the Army. Uh, had some other uh, family members that were in the military. Um, so, that, you know, that was something I wanted to kind of do. I did not think I was going to do a career of it at all. Uh, but um, so, you know, it was 94. Uh, it was right after Somalia. Uh, so a lot of that stuff was on, on television. And, uh um, you know, with the Rangers and the 160th, uh, which I later became, uh, mm. you know, later was in the 160th and stuff like that. So uh, that was kind of neat that it worked out that way. But uh, uh, did you get a did you get to choose your job? I did. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Um, so what 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 was uh, what was boot camp? What was going into boot camp like for you? It was a culture shock. Was it easy? Well. A little of both, I would say. Um, so some of the stuff was just because just you have those pre-conceived uh, you know, conceived ideas of what it's going to be. So it was a lot different on that aspect. Mm -hmm. But um, I think kind of being an athlete in high school, like the physical side of it wasn't that big of a deal. <clears throat> um, I think there's a lot of people in shock on, on that side. Uh, and then going to Catholic school uh, that was, you know, had a lot of uh, rules and regulations. Mm -hmm. uh, and that whether you agreed with it or not, you just kind of had to do it. Um, so I had to wear a tie in high school and different stuff like that. And I went to a Catholic school with nuns. So I got smacked in the knuckles a whole bunch of times. So, wow. that, you know, that side of it um, wasn't a huge shock. Um, so I kind of just, 
I played the gray man, um, so that actually worked out pretty well for me, kind of uh, just kind of floating in the in the background until you know near the end when you started coming up. Um, I will tell you a funny thing though with with boot camp was uh, one of the drill sergeants. Uh, my name's O'Malley, uh, but uh, when you come in, they didn't have the apostrophe on my name tag, mm -hmm. so he just kept calling me Amelie. <laughs> and uh, so one day I decided to correct him. I was like, "Drill sergeant, my name's Private O'Malley." That was a bad decision. So. <laughs> I, I was called Amelie, like with an emphasis on that, Amelie, 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 all the time after that. So uh, uh, I, I moved out into the spotlight, unfortunately, with that, oh, that yeah. mistake. But uh, <laughs> life was good before that, and I, I made a huge mistake by, uh, 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 but you, by graduation, though. I mean, you know, came, uh, uh, you know, per, I'd say as friendly as you can get with the drill sergeant at the end or whatever. Mm -hmm. So uh, I mean, he did a good job, but uh, yeah, it, it was a bad decision for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but what stunk at the end for us was um, we had a bunch of guys got in trouble at the like their last week or so so they made us all shave our heads again <laughs> just you know just like day one instead of you know at, at, for AIT you were able to start growing out you know a fade a high and tight and stuff like that right. and then yeah so when I arrived at at Fort Campbell after that you know I looked like a brand new private and oh. yeah so like you know it all started all over again we, yeah. easy easy mark you know what i mean what so, they get in trouble for so they went uh they snuck out um so they snuck out and met with uh some m female mps mm. so uh yeah wow. hopefully they enjoyed it because it sucked for the rest of us but uh yeah <laughs> <laughs> but yeah i think they had met them on a, on a weekend pass before and then they snuck out uh during a regular duty day uh, mm -hmm. linked up with them so and there was a bunch involved i think there was like 12 of them involved so wow uh, they had like uh, lookouts and had a good operation but didn't work out because they got caught <laughs> so um oh well, they're fairly new to the operation world now, right yeah. exactly yeah yeah nothing yeah they didn't they didn't they don't know what an op order is and contingencies and all yeah, that yeah. stuff. So. wow yeah. so uh it sounds like your first assignment was at fort campbell is that yeah right? yeah with the hunter first airborne Mm, nah, what was so that like? That, um, so that was cool. So it's Hunter First Airborne, but they're actually Air Assault uh, nowadays. It's their history, obviously, with D-Day and all that type of stuff. Uh, but so they, you know, had to go to Air Assault. So that was one of the requirements. So, you, you know, um, you get there. I think I was there for about a week uh, and then um, in my unit uh, for about a week. And then I started Air Assault School, mm. uh, which is a 10-day uh, course. Uh, on, you know, rappelling and fast roping and as well as, uh, you know, directing uh, helicopters so there's like a week you know one of the tests is you have to know all the nomenclatures all the weights and and uh, identification of the helicopters and then you kind of go through the different uh, weeks where you know you have like similar to, to airborne school in a way except there's a written test in it, involved in it mm. uh, and then you kind of have the tower uh, week and then you have you know your final week where you you know repel from a helicopter and stuff like that mm. uh, so in air assault school you don't do any jumps no, no jumps. So okay. it's all, so air assault is all, I mean, part of it is just like an air, you know, getting off. Um, so, you know, uh, basically the Black Hawk comes in low. Uh, we actually had a Huey <laughs> because right. we couldn't get a Black Hawk that day. Uh, comes in low and then you just kind of, um, you know, get in and out of the helicopter uh, just by right. foot, just walking in and out. You practice all that type of stuff. Uh, uh, and then there's also, you also have, get tested on sling loads. So on how to sling load how to uh, set up, uh, whether it's a pallet, a Humvee, or whatever, to be um, picked up, and then the helicopter comes in, and you're on top of that load, and then you hook into the helicopter, and then they take it off. Oh, yeah. uh, but you get tested on, obviously, how, you know, all the different knots and how to, how to set it up and different carrying bags or just uh, all the setups on that type of stuff. And then you finally get to do the fun stuff, which is actually repel from a Blackhawk. Yeah, wow. Um, so, and then fast rope as well. So. Yeah, wow. Mm -hmm. um, uh, did you do any uh, deployments uh, while you were at Fort Campbell? Well, I did. So, um, <clears throat> so when I was with uh, the Hunter First, um, that was the early '90s. Uh, there wasn't a lot of stuff going on, um, and then I went ahead and put in a packet in, and I went to the, the 160th Special Operations Aviation Unit, mm. uh, SOAR, at there, and then um, I went through their Green Platoon. Uh, so they have a um, Special Operations Training Course. It's about a one month course uh, where you just do weapons well one week's just like a hell week type of thing mm -hmm. you do weapons uh, first responder type stuff hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat and land nav uh, and then upon graduation of that I moved on to the to the 160th and then um, 
I was there where I did a lot of different um, deployments before uh, uh, before 9/11. We did a lot of different stuff for different uh, different countries, training events, and other uh, loadouts, and, and moved for other uh, type of operations. And then then I was also with that unit during 9/11, uh, um, and then uh, yeah, deployed to Afghanistan multiple times and Iraq multiple times. So. Oh wow! How, um, how many how many tours did you have to do? So I had a total of eleven uh, tours, but those were not your normal. Um, so my longest tour was five months. Okay. Um, so uh, the thing was that you know with that, that particular unit, most special ops units, I mean, uh, they were deployed the entire time from nine eleven until recently, um, mm -hmm. and then you just kind of your team replaces the next team, um, so you just do rips and it's short uh, short type of deployment. So. <clears throat> you know, you might deploy for 90 days, come back, but during that time, you know, you're going to go somewhere else. You might go to Yuma Proving Ground or uh, uh, different other different locations uh, down to Florida, or different different areas. Do some mountain training. Do you know all the different other uh, South America type stuff, and then you come back, and then you deploy again. So, um, you know. I've had these conversations with uh, you know different guys that were in uh, did the the long term uh, tours and then we're also in uh, special ops units where they you know did the revolving door and everything just kind of got the pros and cons. So mm -hmm. I mean I didn't miss a whole year of my kid's life, yeah. uh, but um, it just kind of felt like I was just gone the whole time. You know you kind of get home, you unpack, you might go TDY for some training somewhere else, uh, and then add in military schools that you have to go to anyways, and then. Um, you know, get done with that, and then bam, you, you know, back on that bird, high five with your buddies. Um, the only good thing is our turnarounds were quick, you know, after a couple, because um, you just kind of would get a data dump, uh, you know, prior to going, and, yeah. and then you get there, and you, you know, might spend a day or so with, you know, with your counterpart, and then they, they blast off and type of stuff of like that. So saw a couple Super Bowls and, over, you know, we saw one in the, saw the, the famous uh, Janet Jackson one in, in Bagram, oh. uh, so, uh, which was a cool thing. So they had the one feed was coming through AFN. They had another feed that was through the uh, computer system. Uh -huh. So you had uh, we got to kind of see the first thing, and if guys forgot it, they would like run to the this back room it was like a meeting room, uh -huh. but they had the inter, uh, internet uh, version, which was like a couple seconds delayed, uh, so you could kind of. Uh, you know, you know yeah. things you do on deployment, man. That yeah. you know that change your day. You know. Yeah. Um, um, what was your What was your primary mission for that first tour, uh, like initially going in? So overall, um, you know, special operations in general, we kind of had you know uh, different units. You get you know your area of operations and stuff like that. Whereas um, it was just high value targets. So it was just it was always evolving, always based off of intel. Um, so if they had a different high value target, a, a cousin of a friend uh, or somebody of UBL that, you know, they're tracking his phone or they're tracking, you know, his movements or whatever. And, you know, it, it could be a lot of, you know, there could be days, you know, that, you know, for one operation, it could be three or four days of planning. And then sometimes it's, you know, a couple hours, um, mm -hmm. you know, so if, if you know the targets on the move and you got to go. Um, so all the like the backside planning of that, um, <clears throat> it was all kind of dependent, you know, um, they were tracking different different guys move around on motorcycles, different guys, you know, jump around and, you know, hide sites and different like that. So it was basically kind of tracking, you know, the eventual goal was obviously to get Bin Laden. Um, so trying to find all these little pieces and take down. So, you know, get into support, you know, Rangers and Delta Force and uh, SEAL Team 6, all these different guys, you know, we were the, on the support side of that, the backside support of that. Um, so just kind of being able to, you know, hang out with those dudes and see, you know, all the cool yeah. stuff they're doing and kind of yeah. being, being part of some of that stuff. But. Mm. Uh, did you, did you see any action that first tour? Uh, for Afghanistan? Afghanistan? No, no, not really. Uh, not a lot. Um, for my mission on that, um, Iraq, yes. Yeah. Uh, but Afghanistan, not, um, not a lot of stuff. Um, I mean, indirect fire, stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, for sure. Mm. Uh, but, um, yeah, it wasn't until, um, yeah, like the Iraq stuff where I kind of saw some stuff. Yeah. What was your well, the same mission? Did you guys have the same mission as a special ops unit? Yeah, like yep, yeah, I was still there. Yeah, I mean, that was, of course, a little bit different because, you know, I was part of the initial invasion. Um, so, you know, kind of coming in and moving across, you know, 
just move, you know we're you know rolling into places that weren't set up at all uh, mm -hmm. to where in Afghanistan you know I wasn't part of that first crew. Um, oh, I did forget the Philippines. I did go to the Philippines. Oh yeah. Yeah, I deployed to the Philippines. Uh, we call it, it was it was under Operation During Freedom P, Philippines. Okay. Um, so we were um, that was in that was before um, uh, we were chasing down. Um, uh, the Abu Sayyaf, which was a terrorist organization uh, tied to Al Qaeda, mm -hmm. and um, uh, they had two um, they had two uh, school teachers, I believe, that they had hostage, uh, if I remember right, um, and then um, were able to rescue one, not the other one. But um, mm -hmm. so uh, kind of that was an interesting one too, because we started in the Philippines at Clark Air Base, uh, where we were living in like it's almost like resort type of you know i would prefer it to, to a resort type yeah. i mean they, they were not it was a they had like a servant's quarters and the thing or whatever and it was this training portion we were there under cover of it as if it was a training portion but it was a build-up uh, it was a scheduled training so it kind of worked out mm. uh, it was a scheduled training event that they do all the time uh, but it was a build-up to follow on stuff that most of us didn't even really like, even know right off the bat you know what was really going on and then as we kind of moved down and, and throughout the islands um it just kind of get got you know the living conditions got worse and worse to where you mm -hmm. know the end where you know you're you're sitting down there and um you know just uh, sleeping on a cot and you know yeah. your skivvy is just drenched in sweat you yeah. know to, you, you know we're like man remember that uh remember that resort <laughs> yeah because <laughs> like, uh, i mean in the beginning man we had driver we had like a uh a filipino was like a a lawyer, um, but he was making more money just driving us around uh, wow. for for that time period, and her like would do trans translate it for us because Philippines have like multiple Tagalog is the main language, but they have multiple languages that they speak there, so mm -hmm. you really kind of need to get stuff done. You know, you need some translators there, uh, but um, yeah, and then on the Philippines, that's where I you know we lost a Chinook. Um, crashed in the uh, in the ocean flying oh. from one island to the other um so um which which was a, the exact chinook i was on like two days prior to that um but um we lost our we lost our commander um the the two pilots um 10 10 total souls that day oh. um so uh, that was a rough thing and that was you know that was tough too because there was like a uh, you know there was transporting um, like the regular SF guys um, to and from different areas and then um, uh, they were they were returning back and uh, ended up in the, in the ocean so that was, yeah. was a really tough one on all of us because <clears throat> with that uh, unit we um, we stood up stood up this um, like satellite unit part of the 160th um, mm -hmm. we moved out to Korea to set it up for forward basing in, in the PACOM, the Pacific Command Area, um, or SOC PAC, Special Operations Command Pacific, but same idea in that area. Um, so we kind of, we all were, uh, you know, showed up together and kind of got a good bond and all that type of stuff. And, you know, our commander was a, ma a major, you know, it was still, you know, one of us kind of living in the bear, you know, we were all kind of there. Um, <clears throat> so um, there was just some, some great guys on there and, um, so that was, that was a tough one for us, but like yeah. anything, I mean, they go down, get a day or so a break and then, you know, do that stuff and then back to the mission. Right back to work. Mm -hmm. Um, when something like that happens then, does anybody come in and like talk to you guys or anything or is it, you know? Yeah. So that was early on. Um, so that was like really early on and I don't think they were really prepared. I mean, they, they did have some, some people talking and, you know. Um, you know, and I think, that, you know, the early deployments on all that stuff, they just weren't prepared, you know, what the uh, family, you know, family readiness groups mm -hmm. weren't really prepared, chaplains weren't, I mean, the stuff happened, you know what I mean, but you'd lose a couple people, but, you know, when you lose, you know, 10 and, you know, two of those were Air Force PJs, a pair of rescue guys, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, we met them on that deployment, so, you know, we got tight with those as well, and they were awesome heroes as well, but, yeah. um, yeah, so that kind of, you know, is one of those tough ones where, you know, I mean, remember we had a night, um, we came in to kind of talk about it, everybody could kind of get some stuff off their chest. Um, somebody went and got some some Filipino beers, um, you, know, you know, like I think it was like one or two, um, 
I'm out, so you can't get me on general order number one right now. Yeah. But um, yeah, and you know, and it's just kind of, just to kind of relax people and people to, you know, funny stories, good stories, and you know, it's, it's one of those normal. Um, I always compare a lot of um, military stuff, at least in, in my experience, to like, you know, kind of like Irish wake type of sale, like, you know what I mean? Like, you're gonna come in and roast the guy a little bit, and remember the good stuff, and mm -hmm. you know, you know, and, and all. And all the funny stuff and all that stuff and kind of but yeah I, you know overall we definitely weren't prepared you know they probably should have had some psychs on 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 board and and they did bring that in later um but um i mean it just it is what it is it's like you know I think we weren't ready for a lot of that combat and yeah uh, procedures and stuff like that weren't there and it's just kind of get back out there yeah then you go to afghanistan come back and you, then you're off to iraq yep mm. yep what was Iraq like for you? Yeah, Iraq was uh, Iraq was probably something kind of what I thought Afghanistan was going to be, and, and maybe it was for those guys that were on that initial in Afghanistan, but uh, just sucked in the beginning. You know, just sandstorm. You know, we're, you know, you're just, we're not, we don't have any infrastructure or anything like that. It's all, um, you know, guys doing awesome stuff to make things happen. But yeah, sandstorm after sandstorm. Uh, just, you know, man maneuvering up towards, you know, different objectives, um, you know, uh, <clears throat> you know, we got to participate in the uh, Jessica Lynch uh, rescue, I don't know if you remember her. Yeah, well, uh, uh, if you were involved in that, then, then we worked to get together. Oh, okay. Awesome. <laughs> All right, good deal. Yeah, I was out there. I was part of the invasion March 03. Okay. Um, and I was part of support of that operation. Okay. You know, Jessica Lynch. Okay, yeah. yeah. Yep. So uh, what, um, what was your involvement in it? Um, so we went on, uh, well, I went at, so I was a Seaburn guy, so I went kind of as, as the talk guy. Uh, and then we did kind of some uh, backside support of, of that. Um, uh, out there on, uh, on so were you? I don't, that's crazy, man. I wonder if we were. I was, we were probably I was, sleeping. I was with the twenty fourth Marine Expeditionary. Okay, unit. okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so we we came in. Yeah. So that was your AO. Uh, mm -hmm. So we came in in the middle of the night, uh, crashed, uh, and then um, we had like the uh, the little birds and all that stuff there, um, and then. Uh, Along with the the Rangers and uh, actually Pat Tillman was was there that day. Oh really? Yeah, yeah, he was part of that one. Um, but uh, yeah, because I remember he was always pissed because that was his first deployment and he joined one to go to Afghanistan and he ended up in Iraq. <laughs> uh, yeah, he was quite annoyed about that. But of course, he got to Afghanistan later. But um, did you know him personally? I met him, talked to him. Oh, wow. I, I wouldn't say like know him yeah like, yeah I mean you know you, you kind of know who the guy is you see him screwing around and, um you know he's the pfc that's just like tackling sergeants you know <laughs> stuff's not going to get away with, you know what i mean you yeah. can't get away with that stuff that we're on. Uh, but yeah i mean you know we, we you know i chatted with him so just to, to know him that would be yeah i wouldn't want to say that but yeah, yeah. It's, i mean kind of you know and i'm not one of those guys usually that like well you know if there's somebody like somewhat famous or whatever i'm usually a guy that uh, uh, avoids them yeah. Uh, but uh, just an intriguing story to me, man. So I just at least oh, wanted yeah. to say what's up to him, and right? you know, yeah. and, which I mean, I'm sure our conversation is, is probably the same conversation he had with like 80,000 people, mm -hmm. uh, but at least I got to have it for a minute. So yeah, uh, but, that's awesome. But yeah, I mean, and then, you know, but it is the army and, you know, he's a younger rank. I was a staff sergeant at the time. So, you know, there's that stuff that's going to go on. So he's kind of like, <laughs> still got to stand in parade rest and talk to me, but. You know, and I'm like, calm down, buddy. Like, I'll, yeah. I'm actually trying to figure this out. You know, just have a short conversation. But yeah, he was actually part of that operation, as well. Um, that was a funny. You know, I remember kind of coming in. We, you know, we we rolled in at uh, man, I can't remember the the little area that we moved into, but <clears throat> we landed in there, and it was you know the middle of the night, and then you know you wake up and you're just like my battalion commander was like laying asleep next to me. I didn't even know he was there. Just, you know, just grabbing a spot after all the, you know, all the weapons accountability, everything's done, and then, hey, we're going to crash or whatever, and then, you know, got up, and then, you know, everyone started planning for the mission and, and stuff like that, so. Mm -hmm. um, do you recall the first time you saw uh, action in Iraq? 
Um, yeah, it was, it was a uh, it was a convoy. Um, so mostly got to do uh, you know heli got to move on helicopters or even a C one thirty on a lot of stuff. So um, yeah, I don't know. We were going into all that stuff, man. But, you don't have to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it's the you know uh, I won't say normal stuff, but. Um, yeah, it's, you know, your, your adrenaline peaks and, um, you know, just a lot of confusion. Uh, nothing really, you know, goes the way you thought it was going to go. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but it's also interesting to see, you know, some guys that you thought were going to be the superstar. And, and sometimes it's, it's the, you know, the bottom of the barrel guy that rises man. to the occasion, man. And I've seen know, it, man. Yeah, it's crazy. I've the people that we were calling shitbirds back right. in the rear, right, fucking stepped up, yeah, out there in yeah. the suck. Right, I've yeah. seen it, and I've seen it. You break, know. break glass in case of war, dudes, man. Like you, you don't, you don't want them standing in formation or talking to anybody. But mm -hmm. man, when you know the shit goes down, those are the guys you want in, you know, working with you. But yeah, um, before that, um, have you have you been? Uh, uh, did you see any like? up close combat experience before that or was I Iraq the first Iraq was probably yeah no that was my first uh yeah up close and personal um yeah the other stuff was um yeah indirect fire you know rounds from farther away you know, yeah but just nothing uh yeah Iraq was some crazy stuff yeah yeah um, for me yeah right right so, yeah. um you know, after going through something like that, and, 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 you know, as soon as you have a moment to, you know, you know, seeing something like that for the first time, you know, I don't know how old you were, but, you know, a lot of us are in our 20s, right? Yeah, I was like, in my 20s, yeah, yeah, yeah. Kids, essentially, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, it's a little older than some, but, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, what kind of things go through your, through your mind, like, you know, are you like shit? Like this is real. This is like we're, this is real shit. Like we need to look out for each other. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've always felt on all all that stuff um, was you know obviously we, you know we have a mission uh, to get stuff, but all of that stuff needs to accomplish with all of us make getting back. You know, I had, I had two little kids uh, at home, um, and uh, you know, and a wife at the time. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, so, and, and the guys to my left and my right, they had you know similar stuff, or you know, some or future kids and future wives or future, you know what I mean? So <clears throat> um, trying to accomplish a mission, but being as safe, you know that you know there's only certain things that are worth something, you know what I mean? Like that are worth that. I mean, uh, like, a lot of things that are worth something. I said that wrong, but. You know, there are only certain things that are worth something, you know, and, and, and that's the people to your left and your right. Mm -hmm. and, and that's that's who I care. If I'm going to go down, it's going to be because of him so that he can get back. Or, you know, uh, that that's that's our goal. And if we're all kind of looking out for each other, um, that's going to hopefully minimize, um, you know, the loss, if not, you know. Um, but, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think that's, to me, that was always the mission. Like, yeah, we got something to do, but how can we do it? You know, with all walking out of here, um, yeah, and all walking out of here, and um, you know, you know, there's people, you know, civilians uh, that look at, you know, military veterans or just even active duty, um, you know, a lot that don't agree with specific politics on why we might be in a specific location, right? Um, and you know, a lot of them, they don't understand that, you know. We're not making the decision to go to go right. there. It's, we signed up for this job, and and you know now we have a job to do, um, and you know every every vet has their own or you know military service member has their own reason for you know getting up every day and doing right. it again over and over. Yeah. Um, and you just mentioned you know the person to your left and right. Yeah. Uh, and you also mentioned your two kids. Mm -hmm. um, were, was that like? Are those things? You know, did you have anything else that, you know, kept you getting up every day and pushing forward? Um, I mean, I'll be honest. I mean, those, <clears throat> that was my main thing. Yeah. Um, my main thing, like, I, 
<clears throat> you know, is, is really just being part of the team, having the team be successful, and then, you know, and I want to see, you know, my kids uh, grow up. Um, I mean, <clears throat> you know, as well as, you know, my, you know, my extended family after that as well. But, um, I mean, those were two, my two, two big things. And, you know, <clears throat> and now, and I, you know, I will definitely say, you know, you know, I, so I joined the military, you know, not really during a time of war, uh, kind of looking for, um, you know, part of the military, what, what they can do, some discipline, getting out of there, uh, getting a different start. But <clears throat> I re-enlisted multiple times, you know, based on, you know, uh, you know, being a patriot, you know, and just really loving this country and wanting this country, wanting to be part of something that kind of helps, you know, this country move you know, forward. <clears throat> um, you know, I remember a bad mistake was I, you know, I re-enlisted um, right before they started handing out all the bonuses, and I literally could have waited <laughs> and, and made a crap ton of money. But, um, you know, it wasn't why I re-enlisted anyway, so, you yeah. know, I wanted to stay in the fight. Um, you know, and, and, and that's a tough thing, I think, being in, you know, in the military in general, uh, being different, you know, where you know, you, you want to see your family, you want to do stuff with your family, but you also have this calling, you know, that kind of keeps calling you back, and it's kind of tough, you know, when they're like, hey, we need, you know, people to do this, we need people to go on in this deployment, and hey, we want to do this, you know, and you're volunteering, yeah, it's just, you know, it's a really a gut punch of like, you know, so am I saying I'm leaving my kids yeah. to be with my brothers? You know, am I leaving? I don't want to go with my brothers to be with my kids. Like, oh, you know, just that pull of, you know, um, staying or going or, you know, do I get out to, you know, whatever, you know, be a stay-at-home dad, be a farmer, be a whatever, man, and see my kids every night or, you know, do I continue with, um, you know, this this family that, you know, has been, you know, some of those guys, I mean, I'm tighter than people that I am blood with, you know what I mean? And, yeah. I mean, those are people that, you know, I've went through, you know, after that, you know, when I went through a divorce and when I went through tough times, you know, um, you know, when I was going through stuff and, you know, sitting in a closet, drenched with sweat, I mean, there was only a few people that care and, and you know, that were going to reach out, you know, I'm not saying my family members didn't care, but maybe they just didn't know what to do. But, uh, I mean, it was some of those guys, man, that, you know, constantly checked on me, you know, and, um, you know, care whether they knew exactly what I was going through or not, you know, they, they were just willing to listen or whatever. And, um, I haven't really found that, you know, there might be one or two people, but I haven't really found that much outside like veterans. Um, mm -hmm. and, you know, I'm sure there's great people out there, you know, but, um, you know, obviously, uh, I've never really felt that. Um, so that's, that's always part of it too. Uh, yeah. man, you're getting me deep today, man. No. <laughs> That's what I do, man. Yeah, yeah I try <laughs> but, to, uh, you know, try I, to stay up here, man. Yeah, I try, I try to stay up here because up here is crazy, and up here, is so yeah, but you're getting me. But it's good. It's all good. It's all and, good. Well, I mean, the reason I'm doing it is, 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 you know, there's a pro there's a problem, right, in the veteran community. There's, oh yeah. You know, we got brothers sure. and sisters taking their lives, yes. right? Yes. Yes. Um, that you know, uh, uh, they don't have, you know, they they're not reaching out to people. They're not talking about it. They're keeping it pressurized, you know, up. Um, you know, the last person I interviewed, he had a good analogy of it. You know, he's like, why does a volcano erupt? Mm. You know, because of pressure, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, so um, it's, it's, it's amazing, you know, everything that you just talked about, you know, right now, the past, you know, minute or two about the camaraderie that you build, mm -hmm. you know, with your brothers over there being closer than, you know, your own blood family. Right. Uh, and you just talked about, like, even, you know, making a decision to choose your kids over them because that's how much of a bond you've built with them. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, a, a, a regular civilian don't understand that. You yeah. know, they, they don't get it, um, yeah. uh, which makes us hard to understand to them. Right, right. right. Uh, yeah, I mean, even it. some of our own spouses don't understand. No, right. They don't know how to deal with it. No, right? they which, yeah. which, you know... Um, leads to separation, divorce, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you know, split up families. So, um, yeah, man, it's, uh, it's a rough transition, especially when you've been through things that, you know, you've been through, you know, 11 tours, uh, mm -hmm. uh, some of the things that you saw 
over there and you have to get out and try to cope with it. Um, you know, uh, we're trying to build more awareness for that yeah. and help, help veterans in those situations, you know? Yeah. And that's, I mean, so I, you know, that's where I do with a nonprofit for veterans. Uh, mm -hmm. we're a local nonprofit. We help out <clears throat> veterans, um, with financial assistance, some, uh, homeless veterans, uh, some home repairs on veterans in opening up, you know, I, I didn't talk about any of that stuff for like the longest time. You know, right. I, I didn't talk to nobody about it. Like, um, my ex-wife didn't know nothing. Like, I didn't come home and talk about any of that stuff with her. Mm -hmm. uh, never did. And I kind of thought that that's what you were supposed to do. Right. I, I thought that was the, or, you know, like, well, they, they tell you different stuff. And, and then even as, you know, being a leader, you know, moving off, I would always encourage soldiers, hey, you know, you need to go talk to the, you know, make sure you do that, go talk to stuff. And if come back from a certain thing or a deployment, we would have to go see the, the psych. Well, for years, I knew how to sit down. I knew what to kind of tell them to where I could be out of there in 10 minutes or less. You know, um, so you can go over this. Now. Are you thinking about this or are you thinking about that? Whether I was or I wasn't. Sometimes it was, sometimes it wasn't. I was pretty much going to say the same thing because I knew what was going to get me out of that chair and back to work and back to the, you know, stuff that I need to do because uh, there's another mission. You know, at yeah. the, you know, the reward for one successful mission is another mission, you know. So yeah. uh, that's kind of what I was always kind of taught. So it's like, hey, great job. Now what do we do next? You know, mm -hmm. uh, we have to, you know, what, what's the next hill to accomplish? Right, uh, right. But, um, yeah, so I think, yeah, it's, I mean, avenues like this and stuff is a great way to uh, let people normalize, I guess is what, you, you yeah. know, kind of yeah. like everybody's kind of going through stuff and different stories and, mm -hmm. you know. And, uh, what, what helps you, Chris? Uh, you know, I know you're involved in this, uh, you know, you got a, an organization helping veterans and stuff like that, um, you know. What other things, you know, help you cope, you know, when you're, when you're feeling it, when you're going through it? Um, do you have a routine? Is there anything that you turn to to pull yourself out or just to keep you, you know, you say you like to stay at this level yeah. up here. How do you stay at that level? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I don't stay at that level, but that's my goal is to stay right. at that level, right? Uh, man, I've kind of done a lot of different things, and I feel like it changes. Um, man, I mean, I went through a, a period of time where, uh, and my current wife noticed it, she, she, pretty smart and able to kind of see certain things or whatever but you know I went through a thing where like uh, I play spades on my on my phone just to kind of you know still somewhat competitive whatever didn't really matter if I win or lose or whatever you know whatever I, I would kind of do that you know um, and that's a good like just to kind of numb it you still got to deal with it uh, but to kind of get over the, the big hump um, you know I, I used to run a lot and different stuff but had different issues with knees and hips and all that stuff so I don't do that mu as much um, but like, like you did say I, I think what really helped me w really is the getting out with other vets and, and the helping thing uh, kind of assisting vets through different stuff I mean I've, uh, I've met vets that just didn't know their benefits didn't do things you know we're in, we're in a rough shop uh, we do a lot of home repairs so seeing that kind of seeing the smile on their face and the appreciation that they got and, and then seeing how that, that kind of changes their, their mood, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, <clears throat> we've gone in and helped, you know, veterans that, like, l l their home has looked like the hoarders, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? They're just stuck in there, and especially it's happening much more with the COVID stuff, so it gives them an excuse. Mm -hmm. So before, you know what I mean, like, you, had to, you know, people were going to show up at your house, you kind of had to try to pretend uh, that, that you were, you know, especially like a single, single uh, soldier that was, or a single veteran, you know, they didn't have someone living there all the time, you know, you, uh, but you still had to have, you know, a living room and some areas kind of clean mm -hmm. just in case somebody showed up. And COVID, people stopped, you know, and, you know, just helped these guys and, you know, and we've helped people with some small stuff and then being, you know, knowing like, okay, now, you know, now I need to start taking care of myself. And sometimes it needs that little, um, you know, and, you know, and I, I try to be pretty chill these days, especially yeah. since I retired, but, you know, every once in a while you got to kind of bring the first iron out and be like, hey, you know, like you got to get it together because no one else, you're going to be the best savior for yourself. We, we can, everyone else can come around and try to do it, but you got to do it. And, and that's kind of, I think, getting out, talking, telling your story, getting out with other vets, or whether it's hunting, uh, going to the shooting range. That's always a fun thing for mm -hmm. me. Um, me too. I, I need to get back jumping. Uh, I was a jump master in the army and stuff. And, oh, nice. Uh, yeah, so uh, Statesboro has a good place down the road. I keep wanting to get out there. So I think that might be another fun because I do notice that, that like if I don't have some sort of adrenaline stuff, if I'm not doing some sort of adrenaline stuff for a while, 
uh, that I definitely get kind of cranky and kind of just stuck in this rut, starts yeah. turning around, and then uh, and I'm not good for anybody. So I kind of have to do a little something that's uh, that's got some sort of adrenaline. And mm-hmm. uh, you know, we've done um, we do an event every year now. It's called Paint the Stigma. It's just a paintball event. Um, get, oh, wow. get a bunch of guys. We call them Paint the Stigma. So it's basically painting that. You know, to me, I kind of focus on. There's like two big stigmas. There's the one, like you know shut up and deal with it, take this thing, shove it all the way down here, shove it in that gut, don't worry about it, um, you know, um, you don't show that to people, you deal with that, you know, maybe with some whiskey or something, mm-hmm. which is not a good method to right. do stuff with, it. it's like the worst thing to do. But, um, not that whiskey's a bad thing, but right. not dealing with that stuff and throwing wh- whiskey on the, on the fire. Mm-hmm. Uh, but. Um, yeah, so, you know, hey, so we can get together. We can, you know, get together and, and you can talk about it and normalize it and stuff. Then the other stigma that you see from a lot of people is that, you know, vets are these broken individuals. They can't, you know, they're scared of fireworks. And I get that there are some people that are, and some vets that are like that. I get that. I'm not, I'm not downplaying them. But we're not all broken. Mm-hmm. And we're not all these, you know, horrible, th- you know, people that are going to snap at a moment's notice and destroy the world. Uh, we might, but... <laughs> right, right, <laughs> we right. Might, but, <laughs> Just yeah. be warned. No, but, uh, <laughs> you know, but no, that we can go out there. We can shoot some paintball rounds at each other and not freak out. That we can have some fun. Uh, we're going to rib at, rib at each other, you know, for, for all that type of stuff. Uh, but you get to kind of lean on that stuff. And, and I get it. Certain people might not be able to do an event like that. And we try to do other stuff for, the, for them as well. But that's one event where you can kind of just get out there blow some steam off, and realize how out of shape we've come now that we left the military yeah. <laughs> when you're gasping after two yeah. rounds. Like, I think, you know, little kids are running around circles around you and you're like... What's your organization called? So it's called a Team Savannah for Veterans. Okay. Um, so basically we just, we work in the four counties around Savannah, Georgia, um, and uh, just kind of helping um, local vets, with, like I said, with financial assistance. Uh, we're doing a big uh, home repair uh, for a veteran that's had a lot of water damage, and he's got Crohn's disease and a uh, Vietnam era guy, um, COPD, you know, and we kind of found some mold in his house and stuff, so we're trying to re- remove, well, we've already removed that and then kind of fixing some other stuff in his house as well. We've helped a lot of, uh, we've helped one veteran and his uh, pregnant wife that were living under the bridge. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, so kind of helped them. Uh, get on their feet, gave him some support for a month or so. He got a job, started going in the right direction. Um, other veterans like that. I mean, <clears throat> one veteran that was living in his car, and he'd go in a hotel for a couple of days, back to his car, hotel in a couple of days. Uh, we were able to help him in a short period of time. Bam, he was able to sign a lease and get into his own place. Nice. Um, so different stuff like that, as well as we you know, do camaraderie and some peer support stuff. Um, and then, um, you know, a lot of times we have people that are in stress come to us or whatever. Um, and uh, a couple of years back, we tried to handle that stuff. And we just kind of over time realized, like, you know, we're not really equipped. You know, I can come over and say, hey, don't do nothing. Let me hear. But now we're kind of better on, like I said, with Fight the War Within is another organization. Uh, the focus, they do first responders as well. And they fo- focus on the, you know, the uh, PTSD. And, and, and the founder, her husband, was an Army Ranger who, who committed suicide. Mm-hmm. Um, so they, they have a lot of great resources and they're doing some great things. Uh, and then there's other organizations as well and kind of, so <clears throat> we'll take that and like I said, that holistic r- approach and kind of give it, you know, we're not the experts on those type of things. Give it to that. We'll help you what we can, but we want you to set you up for success with these other organizations. And then as well as the VA, because kind of, we're more kind of focused on emergency short-term assistance for people because... Mm-hmm. You know, the VA, all these other systems, they have just this long waiting list and all this other type of stuff. So if we can kind of help a person, uh, help a veteran um, kind of get, um, and, and they're not all combat veterans. Uh, there's a lot, you know, that's one we see a lot. A lot of those Cold War uh, veterans are really struggling because there isn't all the programs. There's programs for the Vietnam veterans and there's programs for us GWAD guys. All those Cold War guys, I mean, some of those guys might have done 20 years or, or maybe they did a good 10 or six years and, you know, it wasn't their fault that, you know, that they weren't at war the entire time. Right. Um, so you'll see a lot of those guys that as they're getting older or whatever, going through structures, you know, um, going through situations, not structures, I don't know what I'm talking about. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, going through different situations that, mm-hmm. have, you know, uh, just snowballed or whatever. So trying to get those guys on, yeah. on the right frame of mind. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're going to wrap it up. Yeah. Um, before we cut the tape, any last words? 
No, it was, it was great meeting you. I think this is some great stuff, and I'm excited to see you know all the other interviews and. Uh, I saw some of your stuff on your website. I'm awesome. Continue, so. Yeah, uh, you know, hey, thank you for being here. Um, thank you for your service. Um, you know, uh, it, it's a huge contribution for you to come here and tell your story. It's, it, it means a lot to us here at Urban Valor. So um, thank you. Thank you. It. Appreciate it. Thanks. Push it to the limit. I can't go no more. Red light, no way. I'm coming back home. Long dirt road all on my own. I'm going to be the greatest. Draw my name in the